1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We're going to examine verses 1 through 12 this morning in a sermon that I have entitled Spiritual Leadership. Now let me ask a question. What makes a good leader a good leader? Well, there's different ways, many different ways that we can be able to answer this particular question. One might say that a good leader is one who can communicate clearly, or if they are passionate about what the work that they do. One might say that a good leader is a good leader if he is courageous or if he is grateful for where God has placed him. We might even be able to say that a good leader is a good leader when they are respectful or when they are compassionate. Now, none of these are wrong, but let's turn a corner here and let's begin to ask the question of what makes a good spiritual leader? What makes a a good leader within the church? We, We need to understand that what makes a good leader to lead the country or a big corporate office or organization doesn't necessarily translate into being able to be a good leader within the church. So what makes a good spiritual leader? What makes an effective churchman found within the body of believers? Are you able to identify in this room right now any spiritual leader? Are you a spiritual leader within this church? Do you want to become a spiritual leader within this church? Our text today here actually tells us that a spiritual leader must have three qualities. Obviously, there's going to be many other qualities that a spiritual leader must have. But in our text today, we find three qualities that makes a spiritual leader a good spiritual leader. Each leader within the church must possess these three qualities. And when they do have them, that leader is easily identifiable. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, we find that every good spiritual leader must have the qualities of spiritual integrity, spiritual humility, and spiritual care. Let's start with integrity. Verse 1 says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Well, Paul comes right out of the gate right here and he begins to remind the church that they themselves, they knew that Paul's coming was not worthless. It wasn't meaningless. It wasn't in vain. Now, why would Paul say that? Well, we see in verse number 12 that Paul helped them to walk worthy, a a phrase that we spoke about and learned last week. Paul says, it might look like my trip to you was meaningless. It might look like it was worthless. It might look like it was in vain, but it wasn't. And before he begins to explain why it wasn't in vain, he reminds them of the tough road that he had to walk to get to them before he began to suffer. Verse number two says, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Now, according to the apostle Paul, to suffer is to be physically mistreated while to be spitefully mistreated or spitefully treated rather is to have misinformation shared about you. So what in the world was Paul talking about? Well, what exactly happened to Paul Well, take your Bibles with me and go over to Acts chapter 16. Keep your fingers here in in 1 Thessalonians and go over to Acts chapter number 16. We find here a very familiar text. One where we find about the, the Philippian jailer and how the Philippian jailer was saved, right? We know this story, but how was he saved? Well, he was saved through Paul's preaching. That must mean that Paul's inside of the, of the jail. How did Paul find himself inside of the jail? Well, starting in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, we read this. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. 
This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed. I just love how brutally honest the scriptures are sometimes. He was not happy. He was annoyed and he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or to observe. Then the multitude rose up against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And we know what happens next. They begin to sing psalms and hymns, the giant earthquake, the Philippian jailer gets saved. All because of his suffering and him being spitefully treated. Now, Paul, my gracious, I I don't think there would be anybody in here that would argue that Paul was a different animal, right? Everything about Paul was different. His drive, his enthusiasm, his ability to get things done, his ability to get thrown into jail, everything about Paul was different. But something that made Paul very special was his integrity. He was full of integrity. So let's ask the question, what is integrity? What is biblical integrity? Well, integrity implies that you're trustworthy. Integrity implies that there's this degree that you are incapable of being careless or you have this inability to break a pledge. Biblical integrity means having honesty and having a good pattern of good works. It means having strong biblical principles. A person with with integrity behaves in a godly way and does the right thing even behind closed doors. Paul suffered for his biblical integrity as well as being spitefully treated. But this is what good spiritual leaders must sometimes endure. In spite of their high biblical integrity, they must, must sometimes have terrible things said about them that's not true. Sometimes they must suffer as Paul did in spite of their integrity. But the bottom line is this, a spiritual leader must have integrity. Now moving on in our text, we find next where Paul begins to defend himself. Verse number three, Paul says, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Paul says, now listen here, Thessalonians. He says, our preaching wasn't from error. Our preaching was straight from the scriptures. He says, our lives are not marked by being unclean or impure. Our words were never deceitful. Our integrity would not allow for it. Paul reminds him again of his integrity down in verse number 10. He says, you are witnesses and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Beloved, let me ask this question. Do you have this kind of integrity? Is your life marked by being trustworthy? Do you live by the book even when nobody's looking? This is spiritual integrity, my friends. Every spiritual leader must be marked by their integrity. Now moving on, the second quality that every spiritual leader must possess is that of spiritual humility. Spiritual humility. Paul moves on from his explanation of having spiritual integrity And then he begins to explain the humility that he has. He speaks in verse number four about where his humility actually comes from. Look at it with me. 
He says in verse four, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Paul was entrusted with the gospel. Paul, Paul was entrusted by God to share the gospel. He was, he was chosen by God. He was approved by God to impart this good news to others. So the question is, what is the gospel? What is it? Well, the gospel is the law satisfying life of Christ. The gospel is the penalty atoning death of Jesus. The gospel is the justifying resurrection of the son. And the gospel is the power imparting ascension of the savior. Friends, this is the gospel that was imparted to Paul. Paul believed these things with his whole heart. He literally left everything that he knew behind him. He left an incredible pedigree of being a Pharisee and probably somewhat of a luxurious lifestyle and an easy life all for the sake of the gospel. In return for leaving it all behind, he was rewarded with something. He he was rewarded with a difficult life of suffering life of beatings, shipwrecks, backbiting, rumors, arrest, and eventual execution. You see, Paul knew what he was entrusted with. He knew the incredible gift of this glorious gospel and this gospel utterly humbled Paul. Working as a Pharisee, He continually tried to keep the law perfectly. He realized he couldn't, but was gifted the righteousness of Jesus who kept the law for him. And by faith, Paul received this gift of righteousness and he was forgiven of his sin, just like how you and I are. And this is why Paul could say in Romans chapter one, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. This gospel beloved will humble any leader just like it did Paul. Because he realized that the, the power is found in the gospel. He no longer relied on his strengths and his gifting and his talents to do the work. He actually goes on in verses five and six by saying this, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory for men, neither from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. In humility, Paul totally relied on the power of God. He says that he refused to use words that were flattering. And that's interesting because that implies that there was probably somebody within the church that was very well off. Maybe he could have used a few flattering words to come rub elbows with somebody. Maybe he can get a few extra coins thrown his way. But Paul says, absolutely not. He remained humble. He didn't put on a cloak of covetousness, which, which means he didn't put up a front. He didn't put on this this mask to cover up any kind of greed that he had. What you saw with Paul is what you got with Paul. In humility, he refused to seek the honor and the praise and the glory except from anybody but the Lord. He actually says in verse number four that he wasn't trying to work to please men, but rather he was working to be well-pleasing unto the Lord. But then we get to verse number six. Then he reminds them of who he was. He reminds them that he could have made any kind of demand from them because he was an apostle. Paul could have said, hey, I need you to go over there and do this because I'm an apostle. Hey, I need you to go over here and go do that because I'm an apostle. Because I'm an apostle and I have the authority to do so, you need to go do whatever I say. But is that how Paul operated? No, absolutely not. Why not? 
because that's not how humble leaders operate. A humble leader within the church is never going to make demands like this, telling folks to go do this or to go do that. A leader within the church is one who shows humility, not making demands because he is a leader, but he gets down into the ditches with their church members. A good spiritual humble leader within the church will consistently warn his church members not to go and do said sin, And then when church member still goes and does said sin, he goes in humility and helps them to pick up the broken pieces of their life and never says, I told you so. Being humble according to the Bible is being meek and lowly. Jesus said that we must be poor in spirit. When we possess these qualities, we aren't dependent upon our abilities anymore. We're dependent not on our status. Rather, we are dependent upon the Lord and the power that is found in the gospel. Being humble isn't something that comes easily, though, is it? But it certainly comes when we realize the magnitude of the gospel and the infinite measure of work that Christ has performed for us at Calvary on the cross on our behalf. Once we realize that, beloved, humility soon follows. So a good spiritual leader is one who has integrity, but he also is one who is humble. Finally, the apostle Paul tells us And he shows us that a good leader within the church is one who cares for the church. He cares for the church. Now, when I think of being cared for, I sometimes think of a nurse as she is caring for her patients inside of the emergency room, trying to bring that pain level down. When I think of being cared for, I think of teachers who are imparting all of their knowledge onto their students, accommodating their learning style so that they may be able to understand and know the text at hand. When I think of care, I sometimes think of being a shepherd. A good shepherd is gonna be one who's gonna take his flock away from the bad grass and the dirt and leads them to the good grass so that they can be able to eat good food and drink clean water. Maybe you can think of a different example. But all of these metaphors that I just mentioned, Paul doesn't call himself any of them. He doesn't call himself a nurse. He doesn't call himself a teacher. He doesn't even call himself a shepherd. Now, while all of these different examples that I just gave of what true care looks like, each of them are replete with significance Paul uses a different metaphor to paint the picture of what his care for the church looked like. He uses compelling metaphors, that of a mother and a father, to illustrate the kind of spiritual care and love that he had for this church. Let's read the last section here, starting in verse 7. Paul writes, but we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. For you remember brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Go down to verse 11. He says, as you know, How we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Just as soon as Paul says, remember, I'm an apostle. I can make demands. He had the authority to tell the people to do anything. Paul says, but we were gentle with you. We didn't sling our weight around to get you to go do things, 
to, to make you go serve in the nursery every other week. Rather, we showed you our care by how gentle we were with you. Because of our status, we could have demanded that you follow us, but you're not following us because of that. You're following us because of how gentle we were with you. You're following us because of our care for you. When I first came into the ministry, I was told this, and I'm sure that you've heard it. They don't know, they don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. Somebody else also once told me that you'll attract more flies with honey than you will with vinegar. That's a true statement, is it not? Paul didn't demand and speak sharply. Rather, Paul showed his love to the church like he was a nursing mother towards her own children. Now, each of us in here realize the the affection that a mother has for her children. It's something that really can't be explained. There's not the right kind of words to be able to put towards this. The depth of that love and care cannot actually be described. So Paul says, I love you like that. He says in verse eight, because of the love that we had for you, because you had become so dear to us, not only were we willing to share the gospel with you, but we were willing to share our own lives with you. Paul says something in very similar in 2 Corinthians 12, where he says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Uh, The apostle John says something very similar as well. He says in 1 John 3, 16, that we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is exactly what a mother does. She loves her children that affectionately that she will even labor for them day and night. True care means doing whatever is necessary for the brothers and sisters of the church. Caring for them means sometimes getting out of bed in the middle of the night because your church family needs you. True spiritual care means that sometimes you're inconvenienced for one another Beloved, let me ask you, do you care for those in this room like how Paul is described? Do you care for one another like that? Paul then moves away from the maternal illustration to the paternal. Now, I feel like I can relate some, right? As a father of three young boys, my greatest joys come from teaching them how to do things, right? I love teaching my boys how to fish, how to be able to properly shoot a rifle, how to be able to safely use power tools like a skill saw. But my greatest joy that comes from my, my, my ability to parent them is what John says in 3 John verse four. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk and truth. Paul had this fatherly care for this church and his desire was to help them to walk worthy of their calling. He worked diligently as a good father would to ensure that not only did they know how they are to walk worthy of their calling, but he would even help them to put one foot in front of the other, kind of like how you would take a toddler putting their feet in front of one another. That was Paul's care for the church. And honestly, beloved, spiritual care is the easiest out of all three of these qualities. Care is the easiest quality to possess. Now, why do I say that? Because it's essentially just showing your love for the church. That's all it is. You're showing your love for the church. You're providing meals for the brothers and the sisters when they're sick or maybe they've had a baby. You're providing care for the brethren or giving some kind of assistance when needed or maybe taking them to a doctor's appointment when needed. 
Yesterday here at the church, we had a funeral. And while we were here at the funeral, I was able to see this care exemplified by one of our small groups. One of our small groups came and provided all the food that was needed for the reception. They set it all up. They served the people that came and then they cleaned everything up. Why did they do this? Because of their love for this family. Beloved, we ought to care for each other here today like a mother and a father cares for their children. Why? Beloved, listen to me carefully. For some of us here, you're the only mother and father that we've got. Care for the beloved. Now, as we wrap up our time together here this morning, I I need us to understand something. I entitled this sermon, Spiritual Leadership for a Reason, and I spoke very heavily that a fact on the fact that all spiritual leaders must possess these qualities, the qualities of integrity and humility and care, but I hope you caught on to something. Leaders within the church should not be the only ones to possess these qualities. Rather, every single Christian Every single Christian must possess these qualities. If you're not known for having integrity or you're not known for having this overwhelming uh, humility about you, if you're not known for desiring to care for one another, then I strongly exhort you to evaluate yourself. Are you truly in the faith? Are you truly a Christian? Do you possess Christ or do you merely just speak about having him? I said at the very beginning of our sermon that every spiritual leader is easily identifiable because of their qualities. Beloved, this has to be true about us here as well. Now, certainly there will be others here that are more mature in these, these areas, of course. Right? You can't expect a, a baby to get up and run a marathon, but you do expect the baby to start to sit up, to start to crawl, to begin to walk, and then begin to run. If you realize, beloved, that you need to grow in one of these three different qualities and these different characteristics, as it were, you you need to mature in these areas. What do you do? Where do you go? What's your next steps forward? Well, we must be drawn to these particular individuals who are more mature in the faith, who do possess these qualities in a strong way. These men and these women, they can be looked up to. These are men and women to be influenced by. These are men and women who are a gift of God to the church. And beloved, I need you to realize something that they have been given to you. Among many who serve within our church. And there certainly are many who serve inside of our church who possess these qualities. I'm specifically thinking about our small group leaders right now. These brothers and sisters, they do the work of the ministry day in and day out. They don't come to just uh, Sunday morning services just to teach a lesson and then forget about their class throughout the week. Or rather, they are in the lives of their people all week long. They know their struggles. They know where they are weak. They are their friend. They are their spiritual leader. They are their mother and their father. They think about them. They pray for them. They communicate with them. Does this sound like anything that you need? These leaders are known for their integrity. These leaders are known for their humility and the thrust and the main priority of our small group ministry, their specialty is their care for their class. 
As I work week in and week out with these men and women, I am always encouraged, not only for their love for the church, not only for their love for the word of God, but I am overwhelmingly encouraged for their love for those who are inside of their groups. They vividly live out what Paul says in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Beloved, do you want to be influenced by something like this? Do you want to be cared for like this? Well, the solution is quite simple. Join a small group. You can come talk to myself or one of the other pastors after the service, as well as we have printed a ton of our brochure, uh, small group brochures. They're in the back two tables. Grab one as you are leaving if you are interested. And I pray that you are interest, interested. Listen, beloved, Over half of our church does not take advantage of this ministry. Over half of us. If you're only coming to the church service, you are never going to experience what this true care is like. I want to strongly encourage you, consider to be influenced by one of these these spiritual leaders inside of our church and join their small group. As Paul spoke to this Thessalonian church as a father exhorting his children, beloved, I exhort you, I strongly encourage you to be closely connected to one of these spiritual leaders today. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this ministry for all of these leaders, Lord, who loves your word, who loves the church. Lord, they are madly in love with the people of their group. I pray, Father, specifically for those men and women that you strengthen their ability to lead in this way, increase their integrity, increase their humility, increase their care. But Father, I pray for all of us, Lord, who are not one of these leaders. I pray, Father, that you help us to find our way into one of these groups so that we can be cared for, Lord. Father, thank you for easily identifying those inside of our church who are spiritual leaders. Father, we ask that you raise more up here. Father, we need more men and women who are full of integrity, that are humble, and that will do whatever is needed to care for this church. Father, I am a grateful man to be here at First Baptist Church at Weston. What a wonderful gift you have given me and you have given the people of this church. Father, thank you for your word today. We ask these things through your son's name. Amen.